Hello, this is Brock Lemires, and we're continuing our study of embedded systems design. We are looking at interrupts, and in this video, we're going to look at <clears throat> the steps involved in an interrupt uh, when it's serviced <clears throat> in a little bit more detail, and we're going to see the motivation for using the stack during one of these uh, interrupts handling, and we'll take a look at kind of the details of how that looks, okay? All right, so here we go. We kind of have put a lot together in terms of what an interrupt is and the steps that happen. So let's go ahead and walk through the steps in more detail of what actually happens when an interrupt is to be serviced, okay? All right, first and foremost, you interrupt fires, it raises a flag, and the CPU finishes its current instruction. That's critical. You f it finishes the instruction. It doesn't interrupt the fetch, decode, execute process. What it does is it gets through the execute part. And the reason it's so important for it to complete its current instruction is that you want to have the program counter positioned at the next instruction in the main program <clears throat> that is to be executed. And that's important because we're going to interrupt this thing. We're going to say, hey, stop for a second and come over here and handle this interrupt. So you need to know what the next instruction address is. So we got to make sure that we let that CPU finish that instruction so that the program counter is pointing at the right location. With that information, then we can return to the main program and pick up where we left off. Okay, so then <clears throat> we, yeah, so then that's in the <laughs> program counter. So the next instruction in the main program is put in the program counter. And then we need to preserve that somewhere, so we push it to the stack. Now, think about what's gonna happen here. You are going to totally go somewhere else, okay? The CPU is gonna load up a new address of the, in the program counter to go execute an interrupt service routine, and you're gonna go do a bunch of stuff. And you need full all the full resources of the CPU. So that interrupt service routine needs to have its own you know, status register flags that it's going to potentially figure out or set and clear and branch and jump accordingly. But you also are going to return to the main program that had maybe altered some of those status register flags, and you don't want to mess with those. So you also need to push the status register to the stack. So when this, the next step of an interrupt as it's being handled is that you want to preserve the program counter and the status register, so you push them to the stack. Then you clear the status register, <clears throat> and that's because the interrupt service routine doesn't need any of the flags that were used in the main program. You want to give it a fresh status register, okay? And that's going to show. That's going to actually disable maskable interrupts also because the GIE bit is in there. And we'll look at that in a second. Okay, now. The MCU is ready to start executing the interrupt service routine. So it needs to go find the starting address of that service routine. Where is it? It is held in the interrupt vector table for that particular peripheral. So the, M the CPU is going to go retrieve the starting address of the interrupt service routine from the hard-coded vector, its interrupt vector location for that specific peripheral. And that, and remember, the address that was put into the vector, you did it. You had to put that address into the vector table by using these directives, dot sect and dot short, and then you put the actual value of the address label for the ISR into that location. Then you run it. <clears throat> so it jumps down there, the program counter is, is changed. Uh, it now is pointing at the first instruction of the interrupt service routine, and it goes down and just executes instructions like it's meant to do. So it does fetch, decode, execute, fetch, decode, execute. The only difference is that it's going to come to the end, and it's going to see the end of the interrupt service routine, and then it's going to need to return to the main program. So what does it do to, to return to the main program? All it does is pop the status register in the stack, in the program counter, sorry, from the stack. When it does that, it restores the status register, so all the flags are restored, the GIE bit is restored, and more importantly, or equally important, is the program counter is set back to the main program. But what address went into the program counter? It was the address of the next instruction that was to be executed in the main loop prior to the interrupt service routine. So these are the steps that are involved in here. Okay, so this is great. 
but it does show it does show we need the stack. So here's what it does. It's a, it's pretty simple when you just look at the stack. You basically push the program counter, then the stack pointer, or excuse me, the stack uh, status register, and that, that's the order. And then when you return, you pop them off. Okay, so two 16-bit words are pushed onto there, and that's it. Okay, <laughs> very important because it's dynamic. All right, when you return you need to use a specific instruction. Now this is interesting because to go get the starting address of the interrupt service routine, that is handled automatically, okay? You do not need to do anything to load that starting address into the program counter. So that's gonna be handled automatically when a flag is raised, the CPU checks the flag and says, hey, I got an interrupt, and part of the, the steps that it takes is it goes and gets that starting address from the vector table. You don't have to do anything but you absolutely have to do something when you return from an interrupt service routine <clears throat> to tell the CPU, hey, I'm done. The CPU doesn't know when you're done executing instructions. It knows you have a service routine, but it doesn't know when you're gonna be done. So the MSP430 provides a dedicated instruction called RETI, return from interrupt. Here is one of the things that might bite you. It will bite you. Remember subroutines? Remember how you used RET to return from a subroutine? RETI is a little different because in an RET, when you return from just a normal subroutine, all that you pushed onto the stack was the return address, okay? In this situation, the RETI is pull, pushing, or you are pulling, popping, the return address in the main program via program counter, but also the status register. So that's the big thing. If you ever get that I on there, your program is not gonna work because you're gonna only pop off one of the words that was preserved. Okay, now this is good, this is good. Here's another rule as we talk about interrupt service routines, okay? You have to absolutely put an address label, you have to initialize it, stuff it into the vector table. But another thing that happens is, remember when you use maskable interrupts, Remember the concept of a, of a flag? Well, that's what triggered the entire interrupt service handler. So the flag was the first thing that happened. The peripheral, a timer, an ADD, it said, hey, I raised a flag, I want to be serviced here, so I need something done. <clears throat> well, that flag is raised, right? So you come into the interrupt service routine, it turns out that it is up to you as the developer to clear that flag. So you have to actually make sure every single time you run an interrupt service routine, if it's a maskable uh, interrupt, you need to clear the flag. If you don't, think about what'll happen. If you forget it, you'll execute this interrupt service routine, return to the main program, that flag will still be asserted and you'll jump right back into the same interrupt service routine and you will get in an, in an infinite loop where you can never stop firing this interrupt service routine. So you'll notice that right away because your computer will just hang. So you have to manually clear any flags that were triggered by a maskable peripheral. Okay, so remember that one. All right. Now, here's some guidance of <clears throat> interrupts. Okay. You don't want to put too much code in an interrupt because we're going to be talking about like, can you nest interrupts? Should you nest interrupts? Can they interrupt other interrupts? In general, you don't want to interrupt interrupts, okay? The, a better practice is to make them as short as possible. Make them very dedicated, make them short, make them fast. If they are fast, then the likelihood of them getting interrupted is very low. But you don't want to get in a situation where you jump into an interrupt service routine, then you have a bunch of delay loops and you're doing all sorts of cool stuff and, and just getting all whizzy in here. And it's like, no, make them very short <laughs> and fast. Okay. Now let's think about nested interrupts. Nested interrupts means you have an interrupt that's interrupt, interrupted, and then you have another interrupt that's the interrupts that one. Can you do it? Okay, is this possible? The the yes, the answer is yes, you can do it. Okay. And in fact, if you're running a maskable interrupt, you can always be interrupted by a reset. Okay. Obviously. Reset's the highest priority. But a reset just says, we're done. Something major happened. We're gonna flush everything out of here and start from scratch. So a reset just overrides everything. It basically, it resets the computer, it clears all their configuration registers, and it puts the program counter back at the first address of your program. A non-maskable interrupt also can interrupt any maskable interrupts. And that's because those are meant to handle 
hardware failures. So a clock stops running in a peripheral. You don't want to, you know, that something bad happened. You have to let those interrupt and get the hardware taken care of. However, once you get down to maskable interrupts, think about what happens when you execute one. Remember that when you go into the interrupt service team that the status register was cleared automatically? One of the things that it did when it cleared that was it cleared the GIE bit, the global interrupt enable bit. <clears throat> that meant automatically the, the MCU disabled all other maskable interrupts. You, by default, are not allowed to have another maskable interrupt interrupt your interrupt, okay? If you wanted to, okay, if you said, you know what, I don't want to listen to your advice. I want to create a whole bunch of maskable interrupts that can all interrupt each other. You would have to manually set the global interrupt enable bit in your ISR as the first thing that you that you do, okay? So, in, and it's important, they make you do that. They make you say, I really want you to think about what you're doing because you need to manually set this bit the GIE bit, <clears throat> in order to allow this. So they really want you to, to take a minute and think about whether you should be allowing other maskable interrupts to interrupt you, okay? All right, and then, of course, you can't do anything about non-maskable interrupts or system resets because they can always interrupt you, okay? Once again, just don't do it. <laughs> I mean, just don't do it. All right, just make them short, uh, make them sweet. Okay, that's it. Uh, we've covered kind of the use of the stack, the steps in the IRQ, and talked about, you know, the the nested interrupt approach. Okay, as always, support my channel by subscribing so I can continue to bring you these videos and see you.